Now you could of course also rotate your coordinate system or indeed just these states so that they become not eigenstates of Lz but eigenstates of Lx and Ly. And this brings us to our second topic, namely the relation between angular momentum and rotations. And we are going to establish this once more from two different perspectives, with the first one focusing on the analytical properties of these observables and the second one on the algebraic ones. What I mean by analytical properties becomes clear when we write down the angular momentum component Z in the form that we have encountered it in spherical polar coordinates. So in this form here, which very much looks like an ordinary momentum operator, but with the position replaced by this angle here. And then a rotation about the z-axis would ask us to increment phi by a certain amount, say by some amount alpha. But as we have discussed for position, we can obtain such translations, for instance by an amount x0 from the translation operator, so this operator here. And this worked out because this just gives us a very compact expression of a Taylor series, namely this expression here. And now by analogy, this suggests that we should obtain rotations about the z-axis from this expression here. And this is indeed true when we express this first in this form here. And then we see that this again generates a Taylor series when we apply this to any function of phi. Okay, but this is of course just one very particular rotation, namely a rotation about the z-axis. So how can we obtain rotations about other axes? Well, for the axis x and y, this is very clear because, again, there cannot be any difference between the different coordinate axes, in particular now that we really think in Cartesian coordinates. So we have these expressions here. And then we can, for instance, combine rotations about different axes into very general rotations, say by the Euler angles. But here we can do something which is even more straightforward. Because if we think about this, and again also consider that no direction in space should be special, then we can conclude that a general rotation about any axis, here denoted by a certain unit vector n, should be given by this form here. And this is indeed true, and one can verify this by using the explicit expressions of these angular momentum components in Cartesian coordinates. But this is still a little bit cumbersome, so let us see whether we can verify this using algebraic methods. Well, we have some practice with this already from the case of linear translations, and what we were exploiting at the time was this very general relation, where we worked out these expressions here in terms of nested commutators. And now we are just going to repeat this, but for the case of rotations, and we are going to start with the simplest case, namely just a rotation about the z-axis. So we are going to look at the effect of this on all the three different angular momentum components, starting again with the simplest one, namely on the component Lz itself. But what we really want to work out is the effect on all the three components. And now this case here is particularly simple because the first term just gives us Lz and then we have the commutator of Lz with itself and so all the remaining terms actually vanish. And so indeed this rotation about the z-axis does not change the z-component. 
Now in the second expression, we again start with Lx. This is simply the definition of these commutators for n equal to zero. They are just the value of one of the entries. And then we run into the first commutator. And that's then the commutator between Lz and Lx multiplied by a factor which is minus i alpha divided by h bar. Now this commutator here is i h bar l y and so all of this here becomes alpha times l y. And this will again feature in the next commutator. So there we have to essentially calculate a commutator between l z and l y multiplied again by some factors. There's another factor of minus i alpha divided by h bar. And then this factor alpha that we just had from the previous commutator. And one factor of 1 half coming from the 1 over n factorial. Now this commutator here is minus i h bar lx. And now all of this then here becomes minus alpha squared divided by 2 lx. But now we are back to Lx, so we will have to take a commutator of Lx with Lz, which will give us Ly, and the next commutator will give us Lx again, and so these terms here are just alternating. And the terms in front of this will be powers of alpha divided by n factorial, with alternating minus signs. But what we then have are just the definitions of the cosine and the sine function. And so what we then obtain is therefore cosine alpha Lx plus sine alpha Ly. Now we can carry out exactly the same for the Ly component. And the only difference will be some minus signs. And what we obtain there is then cosine alpha Ly minus sine alpha Lx. And now we see that this has exactly the form of a rotation as we are familiar from rotations about the z-axis. Okay, so this again worked out very nicely on this algebraic level, but so far again just for one particular type of rotation, namely rotations again about the z-direction. So how can we generalize this to arbitrary rotations? Well, I'm not going through all the details, but I'm going to give you the general idea. So far we worked in one particular coordinate system with three axes that we can call i, j, and k. And then we can do any kind of rotation, a rigid rotation in a three-dimensional space, and obtain directions i prime, j prime, and k prime. And now we can introduce new angular momentum operators that refer to these axes here. We can write them very compactly by taking any of these directions and taking the dot product with our original operators. And we can do this for all three different directions as indicated here. And then we can verify that these new angular momentum operators fulfill the same algebraic properties as our old ones. So in particular, the commutator of any two of them gives the third one. And now to make our life simple, we can rotate the coordinate system in such a way that our rotation axis is aligned with our new z direction. And so we can then work out our rotations using the operator Lz primed. And for this, we just need this relation here. And so we can carry out our calculation in just the same way as before. With this, we can then verify this general form of the rotation operator as given above. So this is very general, but then necessarily also a little bit abstract. And therefore, it would be nice to have a case where this relation between angular momentum and rotations is very direct. And this is indeed the case for L equal to 1, the case that I mentioned in the main videos, where the angular momentum components become 3 by 3 matrices.
namely these matrices here. So let us specifically look at the case again of a rotation about the z-axis where we have this operator here. But now we can write this explicitly in terms of a 3 by 3 matrix. So in the first step this becomes this expression And by definition, this is a power series. But this is a very simple power series because here we have diagonal matrices. And indeed, when we look at these matrix powers, this just becomes this expression here. And that means that we really obtain these exponential functions simply inside the matrix elements. This allows us to see very directly what these operators are doing on the angular momentum components. Because when we work this out, this is now the direct multiplication of three by three matrices. And for instance, for the example of Lx, the result is the following. But here we can use the Euler identity to pull all the exponential terms apart into one contribution proportional to cosine alpha. And this just looks like this. And another contribution proportional to sine alpha, which just looks like this. And here we see that this indeed involves Lx and Ly. So this is a very direct way to verify these relations. And all of this makes a lot of sense. For instance, consider the case that we rotate now by 2 pi. And then this rotation operator itself simply becomes the identity operator. So we see that there is this very direct relation between angular momentum and rotations in three dimensions. But let us next have a look how this works out for spin. Well, for spin, we can proceed in a very similar manner to this explicit case of L equal to 1. Because here we can use our explicit forms of the spin operators, which take this form here. And then our rotation operator about the z-axis can be written down very explicitly. First, starting generally with this expression and then inserting these two by two matrices. So this is again a diagonal matrix and therefore we can write it down as a two by two matrix with these entries here. And when we then multiply this, for instance, from both sides to Sx, then we first obtain the multiplication of these two by two matrices here, 
and this result. And using again the Euler identity, we can then rewrite this again as cosine alpha sx plus sine alpha sy. So this is very nice. Everything looks just like we had for angular momentum. And indeed, we can also do this for the y component and again obtain the same result as before. And none of this is a surprise because all of this can also be derived by just using the commutation relations which are of course the same for the spin operators as we had for angular momentum. So everything looks nice on the level of these equations here. But then we realize that there's still a difference between the case of spin and angular momentum, but it's not on the level of these equations, it's on the level of these operators themselves. And this becomes most apparent when we set the rotation angle alpha to 2 pi. Because when we set alpha to 2 pi at these two places here, we realize that the corresponding operator is not the identity operator or identity matrix, but the negative of that matrix. And only if we say set this rotation angle to 4 pi, then we obtain the identity operator. And now this minus sign is very subtle, both physically as well as mathematically. An overall minus sign in front of a quantum state cannot be detected directly. And that's because when we work out the corresponding probabilities, we have to take absolute values of quantities involving these states, and so these minus signs simply drop out. However, we can detect these minus signs when they just appear in part of a quantum state in a superposition so essentially interference experiments. And such interference experiments can indeed be carried out, and this minus sign can then be detected. And just to give you a very rough pictorial picture, what we could do is to have one quantum system and say that there is a probability of one half that it is being rotated in space by two pi, but also a probability of one half that the system remains fixed in space. And then we can see this interference pattern indeed. And what one then says is that the spin state is only returning back to its original state when we not rotate by 2 pi, but by 4 pi. So there is this physical consequence, and that's related to a certain type of phase factors, which is a very general concept, including this plus and minus signs, which is known as the Berry phase. This Berry phase is a very general and fascinating subject, and we're going to see some more concrete physical manifestations of it a little bit later in another of these extended discussions. So we are coming back to a discussion of the more concrete physical signatures just a little bit later on in this course. But mathematically, what we have found here is already very fascinating. It seems that we have discovered a variant of rotations that we are familiar with from three dimensions, but these now occur in two dimensions, namely for these two component vectors here. Now mathematically, the group of rotations in three dimensions is known as the special orthogonal group in three dimensions. And these are the rotations of three-dimensional vectors with real components. Well, down here we indeed have two-dimensional vectors, but with complex components. And now there is indeed a very close mathematical relation between these two different groups. Namely, for any rotation in three dimensions, we can find exactly two rotations in these complex two dimensions. And they just differ by a minus sign. Now this minus sign, as I mentioned, does not have any direct consequences on the observables, and we see this indeed in these expressions here. So there this minus sign does not have any effect. But mathematically this minus sign is there, and just to give you the technical term for this, we say that SU2 is the double cover of SO3. And this has really fascinating consequences, for instance for the topology of these spaces, but this is a level of mathematics that we do not really need.